Well, welcome everybody uh, to this fourth in the seminar series, The Future of Development. I'm Shanta Devarajan from Georgetown University and a senior non-resident uh, non senior fellow at uh, the Center for Global Development. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this session, uh, which is on a very important and interesting topic, which are what are the lessons from China's remarkable development experience for other developing countries going forward. And uh, we have two distinguished experts on this subject. Our main speaker is Yuan Yuan Ang, for, uh, who's an associate professor of political science at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Um, Yuan is the author of two, I would say, seminal books. Um, and just the titles will give you an idea. One is how China escaped the poverty trap. Um, and the second is China's Gilded Age, which is about corruption in, in China. Um, and these two, I think, span the, the range of uh, issues that uh, Yuan has, has delved into. And in many ways, I can say as an economist, I find her insights and her uh, approach uh, the most uh, refreshing uh, in, uh, in examining China. There's a lot of rhetoric around China, and this is one of the most uh, uh, thoughtful uh, 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 treatises on the subject, and you will see that in a, in a few minutes. Um, and our uh, discussant uh, is an old friend of mine, Shang Jin Wei, um, uh, who's, a, who's the N.T. Wang Professor of Chinese Business and Economy and Professor of Finance and Economics at the Graduate School of Business and at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Uh, I, I should say that uh, in many ways, I don't even have to look at uh, Shang Jin's CV because I, I know it because in many ways they were similar to the trajectory that I follow. Shang Jin, like me, went to the University of California at Berkeley for his PhD and his first job was uh, teaching at the Kennedy School at uh, Harvard. Uh, he had then spent uh, some years at the World Bank and uh, the IMF uh, and uh, who's also the chief economist of the Asian Development Bank uh, in Manila uh, and uh, has been on the uh, Columbia faculty now for, for many years. And it's in many ways the, one of the most creative thinkers about China's uh, experience. I still remember his work uh, on uh, the, 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 the one child policy and its connection to the uh, risk-taking behavior of Chinese entrepreneurs um, and uh, subsequent work on that uh, in that realm. So uh, we will, uh, the speakers will uh, speak uh, for a total of uh, 40 minutes, uh, Yuan for about 25 and Shang Jin for 15. Uh, if you have questions, there are three ways you can submit them uh, and we will uh, then collate and, and ask the questions and we'll have about half an hour for questions. You can either send them as an email to events at cgdev.org. You can tweet at cgdev, hashtag cgdtalks, uh, or you can submit them via comments on YouTube. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, let me now turn to uh, Yuan for her presentation. Yuan, you have the floor. Thank you very much for having me. Allow me to begin by uh, sharing my screen. And I hope everyone can see the slides, yes. Shanta, you can see every, you can see, yes. Okay, great. Well, a, a big thank you again to the CGD for hosting the series. It is a great privilege to be part of this dialogue with Shanta and Shang Jin. And for me, it's also a great opportunity to reflect on my work on China's development experience. So today I'd like to share my thoughts on, on the lessons from China's rise. Now, there is no question that China's rise is impressive. It has dramatically improved the material well being of 20% of the world's humanity, and it has affected all of us around the world. 
So when people look at China's rise, they tend to have two extreme reactions. Either they fear it or they adulate it. But I would like to suggest that there is a middle path. And for that, I recommend three simple principles to guide us in learning from China or any success case for that matter. Number one, learn from both China's successes and failures. Number two, don't learn the wrong lessons. And number three, adapt the right lessons to different national contexts rather than blindly copying. Before diving into the details in China, let us step back and think about a generic question. How have we been learning from success cases so far? For a long time, the standard approach to learning from rich and powerful nations is to ask, what have they done right? And this approach has been applied in the last century to a variety of success cases, beginning with the rise of the West in Europe, followed by the rise of America as the superpower of the 20th century, and during the 1970s to 1990s, the rise of a group of emerging economies in Asia known as the Four Dragons. In all of these cases, scholars and commentators ask, what did they do right? In Europe, the answer is democracy, alternatively termed limits on government, inclusive institutions, good institutions. In the US, one popular answer is neoliberalism, more markets and less government. In Asia, the answer was the opposite, strong states that intervene in the economy, make industrial policies and pick winners. But this conventional approach of focusing on what success cases did right has consistently met with backlash. Democracy, which is once vaunted for fueling the rise of the West, is now threatened by populism and polarization. In America, neoliberalism is now being blamed for inequality, lack of public investment, and a host of other problems. And in Asia, after the 1997, uh, 1997 financial crisis, state intervention went from being a target of praise to becoming the source of corruption. As a result, if you look at the pattern of learning in the past century, we have repeatedly undergone cycles of hype and euphoria, followed by disillusionment. In reality, every success comes with certain costs, risk, and failures. We should not emulate only the glamorous facade we should also look behind it because the good and the bad come together as an inseparable package. So instead of asking what success cases have done right, we should be asking what have they done right and wrong. In China's context, this means that we should ask what are the up and downsides of China's path since opening markets some 40 years ago? What are the things that we should learn from China and what are the things that we shouldn't learn? On the one hand, the upsides and achievements are clear. China has sustained rapid economic growth, but this is no small feat given that many other countries are still stuck in poverty. Through rapid growth, China lifted an estimated 850 million people out of absolute poverty contributing to about two-thirds of global poverty reduction. Beyond growth, China also became the world's factory, producing most of the consumer goods that we buy. So if you are a consumer, you have been a participant in China's rise. But this phenomenal growth has its cause and problems. The list is long, but I will highlight just two, corruption and inequality. These are features of China's development model. They are not occasional aberrations. In taking lessons from China, we must understand the whole system, both its strengths and its weaknesses. Let's begin by understanding China's strength. 
which is not authoritarian power, but adaptability. To understand the origins of adaptive governance in China, first, you should know that there has been at least three different Chinas since 1949. China under Mao, China under Deng, and China under Xi are not the same. So when one talks about China, one should be clear. Which China are you talking about? And in this segment, I will focus on Deng because it was Deng Xiaoping and the legacy he left behind that took China from poverty to middle income status. When market reform began in 1980, China was a very poor country. Its GDP per capita was lower than Bangladesh and Chad. Now today, with the benefit of hindsight, it's easy to say, now obviously back then, everyone knew that China would rise, right? Well, writing in Foreign Affairs in 1980, Ross Terrell, a China specialist, wrote, China is still a boss, poor, agricultural country. No Chinese government, however brilliant, dedicated, or capitalist-minded, could possibly bring the per capita GNP of more than 1 billion Chinese people to $1,000 by the year 2000. He was writing in response to targets set by Deng Xiaoping in 1980. Now, as people from the future, we know that by 2000, China exceeded or came very close to that target, depending on the currency you use. In other words, in the early days of reform, it was by no means obvious that China will become an economic superpower. So what are the causes of China's phenomenal success? Now, there are numerous factors, everything from the existence of a reform-minded leadership, opening up the global markets, education, cheap labor, FDI, and the list goes on. You can keep adding another factor to this kitchen sink. But while all of those factors are relevant, none is complete. I think of this as the tale of the blind man and the elephant. Depending on where you choose to touch, you feel a different factor. But that is not the whole elephant. Indeed, I'm going to show you that even within a small location in China, you can find different factors and different models being relevant at different times. The protagonist is Blessed County, which today ranks among one of the wealthiest counties in Zhejiang province on the coast of China. It has about 800,000 residents, a vibrant private sector, and like in other parts of China, it has dramatically transformed in 40 years. This transformation proceeded in a number of steps. In the 1980s, Blessed County did not have private property rights, but only collective ones. Nevertheless, industrial output still grew 33 times during this period. So if you look only at this snapshot in isolation, you will conclude that China is a model of good enough governance, meaning that incremental changes are sufficient to stimulate growth. Yet the story continues. In the 1990s, Blessed County carried out massive privatization that created the county's first generation of official private entrepreneurs. This snapshot indicates a different China model, one that is closer to the Washington Consensus stressing limited government and private property rights. And it goes on. Entering into the next decade, the county's economic expansion was constrained by the lack of planning and infrastructure. So the county government took on an interventionist role, constructing the county's first central business district and forcefully relocating businesses into state-designated zones. And this laid the foundation for a more advanced stage of capitalism. So by this point, a third China model emerges, a developmental state that actively plans and intervenes in the economy. In summary, if you look at the whole time scale from the 1980s to, to the 2000s, there is not just one, but multiple China models within this small Chinese county. On a national level, 
you can imagine an even greater variety of models, particular to certain places and certain times. In other words, what is common across China is not a particular method or a particular cause, because there are all kinds of methods and causes. Rather, what is common to China is a system of adaptation. I call this directed improvisation, the mixture of top-down direction from the central leadership with bottom-up improvisation among local governments, using methods that vary over time and across regions, as I've shown you. The result is diverse solutions tailored to local conditions and stages of development. Directed improvisation can be found across policy areas in China, from investment, education, land sales, urbanization, to innovation policies. It means that throughout the country, local governments share a common set of goals and incentives, but they devise local methods to achieve those goals. For an analogy, think of McDonald's. Same company, same brand, but many regional menus. So we've now learned about adaptability in China, which is a big part of the country's rise. But there are also downsides. And the person who knew this best is Deng Xiaoping, who famously said, let some get rich first. In the process of opening up to capitalism, inequality will arise, he predicted. And government officials will be among the chief beneficiaries of rising wealth. What he probably did not foresee, however, is the magnitude of change. By 2012, China has surpassed Japan to become the world's second largest economy. Simultaneously, the level of income inequality measured by the Gini coefficient had exceeded that of the United States. And according to the Chinese president himself, corruption reached a grave and shocking level. So what accounts for this mixed report card? Because on top of an adaptable bureaucracy, China also practiced an economic model of growth on steroids. And because of time constraints, I can only give you a vastly simplified account here. Okay? So I'm only going to give you some broad strokes. So let's rewind to the early 1990s. Deng Xiaoping had retired, and he handed over leadership to a new generation of leaders. In 1994, as part of a larger package of modernizing reforms, Beijing carried out a tax reform that centralized taxes and left local governments desperate for revenue. As a compromise, the central government allowed local governments to lease land to corporate entities for a one-time fee, and this is known as land transfer fees they became a major source of revenue for local governments. These fees grew 120-fold within 20 years since 1999, and they're still rising today. In addition to leasing land, local governments also set up government financing vehicles, shell companies that borrowed from banks and subsequently issued bonds, typically using land as a collateral. These mechanisms created the key ingredients for growth on steroids. You have growth-hungry local officials who are now equipped with land revenue and loose credit. Then in 2008, there was an external shock to the system. The U.S. financial crisis forced the central government to release an unprecedented $586 billion in stimulus which further catalyzed the system. And since then, the result has been a mixed bag of consequences. On the positive side of the ledger, China saw a rapid infrastructure boom. From the 2000s onward, there was a dramatic expansion of roads, railways, highways, long distance cable, bridges, and more, all across the country, thanks to rev land revenue and government borrowing. This infrastructure has turbocharged China's growth. And Professor Wei's lecture will talk more about this. But there's also a negative side to the ledger. High stakes transactional corruption among elites exploded. 
because government officials were in a position to give out lucrative benefits, such as cheap loans and land deals. That is why between 1998 and 2014, while corruption with theft, including embezzlement and misuse of public funds, declined because of various state capacity building reforms, corruption with exchange, particularly bribery, exploded. This evolution of corruption was accompanied by a problem of mounting local government debt, the bubble that many fear could burst, and last but not least, rising inequality. China's rapid growth created a large middle class, but it also created a very small class of super rich, particularly individuals with connections and control over property. And that is how, in 2012, when President Xi Jinping took office, he took over China's Gilded Age, a country that was rich or much richer than before, but also risky, unequal, and corrupt. The upsides and the downsides are all part of the same system. So far, the president's approach has been to eradicate the excesses of the Gilded Age through commands and campaigns, reversing many of Deng Xiaoping's pragmatic and bottom-up approaches. How this latest chapter will play out remains to be seen. But one thing is clear, China has come a very, very long way since 1980. And we are all affected by this process in ways big and small. In conclusion, what should we learn and not learn from China's development experience? First, let's be clear about the wrong lesson to avoid. One frequently touted wrong lesson is that authoritarianism is the path to growth. The logic is that since China is not a democracy and it has achieved growth, therefore autocracy must be the answer. This is simplistic and misleading because if autocracy is good for growth, China would long ago have prospered under Mao. Rather, what China has shown us is that a single party autocracy can incorporate adaptive governance and it is adaptability that enables performance. But Adaptive governance is not unique to autocracies, of course. China represents only one form of it, and all societies should and can invent their own versions of adaptive governance. More specifically, under Deng, China followed a system of directed improvisation. It shows us that the role of government should be to direct, support and foster innovation from the ground rather than simply command and control. Another lesson to learn, and this is a nuanced one, is that the bureaucracy should be incentivized not only to pursue growth, but the right type of growth and development. On the one hand, China has successfully created a growth-oriented bureaucracy. But achieving growth at all costs can also create perverse consequences, such as environmental degradation, rising government debt, and other problems I have described. To be sure, it's not easy to create a growth-oriented bureaucracy in the first place, but it is even harder to create one for quality development. This is the deep structural challenge now facing the Xi leadership. On a final note, this lesson is really simple, but it is worth reminding. We should know the pros and cons of any development model, whether it is European, American, or Chinese. The Western European model was not just democracy. It came with imperialism. The American model was not just liberalism. It came with financial crashes. The Chinese model is not just growth. It came with corruption, and inequality. And you can think of this as buying a car. 
you don't just want the salesperson to tell you how great the car is. You also want to know honestly, what are the problems with the car? Will it sometimes break down? And what do you do when it breaks down? In short, policymakers in developing countries should be pragmatic. They should take lessons from other countries that are useful and suitable for their own context, but they should at the same time mitigate possible risk and costs. And that I propose is the right way to learn. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to Shangjing's remarks and interaction with the audience. Well, thank you very much, Wen. That was great uh, and very much uh, uh, to the point uh, and some really great lessons, also some great questions. And let me just mention to the audience that you should start sending your questions in early. What we have found in the past uh, is that uh, the questions start coming towards the end of the session and we don't get a chance to answer them. So uh, please start early. Um, now let me turn to Sheng Jinwei, uh, who give his take on how to learn from China's development experience. Thank you very much, uh, Shanta. It's a pleasure to uh, share uh, some of my thoughts following Professor Yuan Yuan's uh, very excellent uh, presentation. So China, uh, in a way, uh, is an uh, uh, enigma. It was extremely, extremely poor uh, uh, when the reform and opening started in early 1980s. Uh, how poor was it? It was not just poorer than you know, uh, US, Japan, uh, France, but it was poorer than Malaysia, uh, Philippines, India, Thailand. In fact, it was poorer than most countries in Africa uh, and uh, Latin America. When I first came to the United States in late 1980s, my very meager graduate student stipend, about $600 a month, was higher than the salary of an experienced surgeon in Shanghai. How do I know? My father was an ENT surgeon, multiple years of experience, a clinical professor in a medical school, a textbook writer. He was earning less than my very first uh, graduate student uh, uh, stipend checks. I know something was not uh, right uh, in uh, China. Uh, when uh, China was uh, uh, just coming out of a central planned old economic model, it, it had to figure out uh, what to do. It wasn't uh, uh, clear the path uh, 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 forward. Uh, the, um, you know, if uh, uh, China and the story, you know, what happened in, 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 the, in, in the subsequent four decades in terms of the end result, we sort of know uh, what has come out of uh, China. But if China were a gross disaster, uh, uh, you know, I can bet that many experts will tell, uh, will, will tell us, uh, you know, there's a very e elegant theory to explain why China has failed. For example, you know, a Wall Street Journal was founded in 1889. So for its uh, 1989 centennial uh, edition, uh, it thought it would be interesting to make predictions about the future of the world economy. In particular, uh, it, it, it's, you know, you know, a list of the set of countries that Wall Street Journal, in its judgment, will be gross disasters. It also listed a set of countries that the, the, the journal think uh, will be uh, future growth stars. A few future growth stars, Wall Street Journal listed the Bangladesh, Thailand, Zimbabwe, among others. And for growth uh, 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 laggers, China was prominently um, featured. Why? No one reading the article perhaps was particularly uh, surprised by their prediction because there's so many things was not going right uh, for, the, for the Chinese uh, economy. It's a highly centralized bureaucracy, uh, Communist Party, top-down management, corruption, uh, in, insufficient openness, extremely inefficient to stay on firms. And at the time, uh, you had China had uh, uh, a very relatively high inflation. That problem was growing. Pollution uh, was uh, uh, very visible or invisible if you, if you went to Chinese uh, cities invisible of other stuff. So, so uh, uh, again, so if China were to grow terribly, uh, no one would be no one would be surprised. Everyone thought it would be confirmation of whatever theory they might uh, uh, they might have. And of course, uh, in the subsequent few decades, uh, Zimbabwe, the growth star that uh, uh, Wall Street Journal predicted, turned out to be a growth uh, disaster. Thailand actually was doing very well uh, compared to most other countries. Uh, if you look at long stretch of time. Chinese uh, 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 growth uh, simply just uh, showed up, uh, surpassing all of its very poor peers, and eventually surpassing Thailand uh, is uh, 
uh, well. Uh, it turns out in the last for some decade, uh, four plus decades, uh, China was the fastest growing uh, 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 country, uh, essentially. That means that if other developing countries were to make the same number of mistakes as China had, no more, they would have grown faster uh, than they actually uh, actually did, right? So that uh, 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 that's why we are we have this uh, conversation uh, here. That you know, what is the thing that we can learn or not learn from uh, Chinese uh, experience? My um, uh, observation uh, is that uh, China has not invented any new recipe or new economic principles. What works for China, Chinese economy are things that we think are important. Uh, chiefly, uh, empowering individuals uh, uh, is very important for economic growth. That includes uh, encouraging uh, competition or removing barriers to competition as much as one can, uh, and reducing expropriations. Uh, uh, as much as one can. These are important. Okay, whenever those things, the in areas where China is doing relatively well uh, in competition, in limiting expropriations, you see growth. In areas or times when China is not doing so well, uh, in those areas, you see uh, you see a China, a China going uh, backwards. The other uh, uh, basic principle is that the free market outcomes are not always socially optimal. There are times when uh, free market behaviors need to be corrected. So the economists call market failures. There are times markets may be missing and need to be created uh, so that uh, you can lay the foundation for uh, individual uh, 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 innovativeness, entrepreneurship to be uh, to be uh, uh, exercised. So I think what China has done, uh, areas where China has done right are, are demonstrations of the importance of those uh, those uh, principles. Uh, China has a uh, share of uh, um, uh, uh, mistakes that, that are equally important for us to keep in mind. Uh, you know, uh, 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 certainly, uh, um, you know, bureau, uh, bureaucrats are, are people, and people, even with best uh, intention, don't always produce the best possible uh, outcomes. Uh, they can they can mis misunderstand what, what is socially optimal. Plus, when bureaucrats are people and bureaucrats' interests need not be the same uh, as uh, as the uh, you know best social objective, they could also uh, have problems when when uh, when 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 government is uh, too uh, too powerful. And the you know uh, uh, Professor Ann's uh, description about uh, uh, what what he what she called the blessed county uh, uh, example is a very good illustration that the entire process of Chinese growth is a constant tension. Uh, uh, between excessive interventions and insuff insufficient intervention uh, from the, on, on the part of a, of a government. There are areas in which uh, uh, that uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the state role uh, in the economy uh, seems to be very helpful, and there are, uh, there are examples of uh, counterproductive uh, uh, interventions. So, um, so, so I think uh, uh, there are no new economic principles China has invented, but nonetheless, the actual implementation of those principles, there are interesting, uh, interesting things uh, that uh, that's useful uh, for um, you know development uh, people who care about development uh, to 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 uh, pay attention to uh, how China promotes competition, how China uh, improves security and property rights. Um, I think are, are interesting. I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit. Uh, it is important. Uh, many of the uh, uh, cases. In, uh, in which China manages uh, policy reforms have the uh, feature of tending to minimize number of losers. So, so any policy changes, no matter how wonderful they may be, uh, the process of change can often create winners and losers. Now, China has not avoided uh, having losers all the time, but many of the many of the reforms, including uh, in, including price reforms, initial introduction of uh, private property rights, and so on. You can do it in the way that we, we see in Russia or Eastern Europe. You have massive uh, uh, losers, lots of people losing uh, losing uh, jobs uh, in some of the Central European and, and Russia case, you have a decline in absolute standard of living for a while, de uh, declining life expectancy. China avoided that. Uh, I'm going to argue that some of the way uh, China manages policy changes uh, uh, are quite interesting and, and, and have uh, potentially carry general, generalizable lessons. And number four, uh, uh, correcting uh, uh, market failures that uh, that uh, uh, is uh, also important uh, part of uh, uh, 
policy, economic governance model. And number five, cultivate a pro-growth uh, bureaucracy. So finally, you know, we need to learn from mistakes as well as, uh, as uh, successes. So some example about promoting, promoting uh, comp uh, competitions. You know, China had, uh, uh, you know, Chinese economy was extremely, extremely close. You can imagine uh, North Korea today is image of China uh, four decades, four, four and a half decades ago. Uh, and, and opening up uh, the economy to competition from imports uh, uh, and to foreign direct investment a very, very important part of this uh, promoting competition. Uh, Chinese, uh, uh, everyone knows about Chinese very fast export growth. Perhaps fewer people realize that Chinese import growth has extremely, extremely fast. That if you look at to which market US has been growing US exports the fastest in the last two or three decades, the answer is China. No country has absorbed more imports from US in terms of growth rate than China in the last two or three uh, decades. And, and the growth of imports uh, uh, provides uh, uh, competition to domestic uh, firms. Foreign direct, direct investment, China had virtually no foreign firms uh, four decades ago. Today, it is the largest destination for FDI, sometimes vying with the US being the number one or number two destination for, F, uh, for FDI. Last year was the clear num uh, top destination for FDI uh, in the world. And then, uh, Progressive uh, uh, removal of uh, five-year plans and other government plans, converting them from administrative orders to signals, to, 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 to non-directing uh, signals, uh, were part of the process of promoting more innovation uh, and initiatives, something that uh, we might not uh, think about uh, looking from the uh, uh, labels. The effect to privatization, that uh, Chinese economy uh, was uh, uh, extremely uh, state-owned, the state you know, accounted for 99% of uh, GDP created. Today, it's about a quarter of a GDP created uh, uh, by, uh, by state-owned firms. Anti-dumping laws, uh, negative list uh, uh, in recent uh, reforms were very important. Here's a graph that shows uh, uh, reduction in trade barriers, uh, extremely dramatic reduction in trade barriers uh, uh, in China. So the, all the great dots, uh, were other countries' trade barriers relative to their uh, income. Globally, uh, we see a very strong negative uh, association between the two. Richer countries tend to have lower trade barriers than middle-income countries. Middle-income countries tend to have lower trade barriers than lower-income countries. On average, Chinese, uh, so that's, these are great dots. Uh, China in the late, uh, in early 1990s were here. Extremely, extremely high trade barriers. Like I said, it's not like North Korea. Um, and then in, in years leading up to its accession to WTO, it has dramatically taken down its uh, trade barriers. But, so this is about 2001. By the time it, it uh, joined WTO, uh, it had trade barriers higher than US for sure, continue to be higher for US than for sure, but roughly comparable to other countries in, uh, in the same income, uh, income bucket. So uh, FDI already uh, told you a very rapid increase in, uh, increase in FDI. Importantly, in the, in the area of promoting competition, uh, another interesting thing to, to, to note uh, is competition among local governments. Uh, uh, you know, we have competition among states uh, in the US, but China has its version of competition among, among local governments. One of the significance of that, this is introduced after the reform uh, started, was that they also place a check on potential temptation by government officials to expropriate firms on their territory. But when um, uh, local GDP growth becomes a KPI of local officials. They pl place a check. They actually want to work with firms rather than uh, trying to export their firms, or at least this place place a constraint on their uh, temptation to to expropriate. And then there's uh, a tolerance, uh, at least uh, uh, sometimes encouragement, uh, bottom up improvis improvisation that Professor An uh, talk about that that, that is very uh, uh, important. Uh, the last uh, line was from Professor An's. Uh, a previous version of the slides, I'm not going to repeat. I, I, should, I saw that she had very uh, changed it to a, to, a, to a very interesting uh, alternative phrase. I'm, I'm not going to use that. Uh, and, and this uh, competition among local governments uh, shows up in multiple ways that, that you know, Chinese uh, local officials, uh, if you talk to uh, any international firms uh, uh, in China, they will tell you that local governments compete with each other, trying to attract, uh, attract uh, uh, for, uh, firms to be to be there, offering tax incentives, offering simplified uh, you know license approval, uh, and uh, uh, so on. So competition among local governments uh, turns out to be 
uh, important part of uh, uh, this school's picture as well. Improving property rights protection is not something that perhaps people uh, uh, um, uh, I think uh, much if one's understanding of China stays with just reading Wall Street Journal or reading uh, New York Times rather than visiting, uh, visiting the, the country. Private sector firms have grown a lot. Uh, uh, you know, from no private sector firm to, to producing you know, roughly three quarters of the country's uh, GDP today, following investor firms the same, even still enterprises, uh, they, uh, they are still comparatively less efficient than, than private sector firms. It's important to, 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 uh, to, to keep this in perspective. One is steel firms in China today are a lot more efficient than they used to be, partly because government uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, successive uh, governments, they have pushed them to, to, to be much more commercially oriented. Many of them are, have been pushed to be listed on stock exchanges with uh, uh, you know, often international investors uh, playing the role of a monitor. Sometimes they will have international strategic investors uh, sitting on their boards. So state-owned firms have been pushed to be a lot more efficient than they used to be. And state-owned firms arguably are more efficient than their counterparts in many developing countries I have visited. Uh, that, 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 uh, so um, that's, all, that's also an important perspective to keep in mind. Even intellectual property rights protection a point of contention between US and China that, they, that one would think, you know, uh, this is a country that has no protection for inter intellectual property rights. If that were the case, you will not see as many foreign firms in China uh, as, uh, as, uh, as they are uh, uh, now. So let me give you a picture of intellectual property rights protection. It's something that's very hard to measure. So when, when uh, uh, the previous uh, US uh, Secretary of Commerce and, and, and USTR, US Trade Representative said, this is a country that steals our stuff all the time, no protection for intellectual property rights. I was asking myself, how would one, would, how would one go about measuring strength of intellectual prote uh, protection uh, and evolution of the strength of intellectual property rights protection? It's a very hard problem. But, uh, but one way one can measure this uh, is to look at, you know, you want to collect data, objective data. One way we can look at this uh, is to look at uh, a country's Royalty payment to foreign patent holders and other property rights holders. So those fee these things are well recorded uh, in balance of payment data. Uh, yeah, you can go to IMF for sure to look for this for China as well as for other countries. They will allow you to do cross country uh, uh, comparisons. So on on this slide, I show that uh, across all uh, IMF uh, member countries, a country's uh, typical royalty payment to foreign intellectual property rights uh, uh, holders is a share of their countries, relative to their countries uh, uh, per, per person, relative to their country's income level, you see a strikingly clear pattern that is unbalanced. Richer countries give you higher per person payout to foreign uh, uh, rights, intellectual uh, property rights holders. Th this part of association is not surprising. Richer countries tend to have better intellectual property rights protection and richer countries' economy is also more innovation in uh, intensive, more reliant on intellectual property rights. So this is a global pattern. Okay, now let's uh, superimpose on this graph on the trajectory of Chinese intellectual property rights uh, uh, protection measured by this measure. These are the red uh, triangles uh, starting from 1997, the very first triangle, all the way to uh, 2017. What you see are two things. One is, in fact, uh, uh, intellectual property rights protection or the respect for foreign property rights measured by this uh, metric uh, looks like part of similar to international norm that China is no more, no less uh, stronger by this. Uh, China uh, actually uh, uh, pays a lot of uh, royalties to foreign patent and license uh, holders. And as income rises, this share rises because Chinese GDP rises much, much faster than almost any other country uh, in, on this picture, that means Chinese royalty payment also to, to US and other foreign rights holders are, are growing much, much faster. In, in fact, I did some calculations that you know, US, uh, the growth of Chinese uh, uh, right, uh, uh, IP fee payment to US uh, IP holders, is a lot more faster than virtually any other country that US uh, receive uh, this number. The third lesson is the minimizing uh, number of losers from uh, policy changes. I think it's very, very uh, interesting. This, this by itself will be like a one hour lecture. Obviously I don't have one, one hour, but I just as, in terms of highlights that, that you know, uh, 
back to 40, uh, 40 years ago when China was extremely inefficient uh, economy and China knew it was an inefficient economy. And many you know, country uh, so-called transition economies coming out of uh, formerly central plan economies know their economies, economic model was not working. They also know the destination. Destination is to be an economy like maybe Singapore or US and so on. The, the, the instinct might be uh, uh, to, in terms of policy change is to dismantle the old system as quickly as possible to create a space to move to, uh, forward. And that's what we see in Central Eastern Europe and, uh, and, and Russia, a, a temporary reduction in li living standard. Many people uh, 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 went on the street because of massive unemployment. The Chinese way of reform uh, is, uh, uh, is characterized by dual track approach, that it, which, is, um, uh, which means during the transition period, you keep the old system, old quota, old planning, but simultaneously you remove barriers for people to go beyond quota to produce according to price signals, to, 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 uh, to, to get uh, another job uh, according to uh, uh, what they think uh, is good for them. This way of managing this very unorthodox, uh, unorthodoxy, but essentially allow whoever get some benefits from the old system continue to enjoy the, old, the benefits, meaning no, no losers, you, you were as well else as before, but on the margin, if whatever you produce can can fetch a, uh, if you can produce new uh, uh, new things or more things and fetch a uh, market price, you will do that. So uh, so uh, uh, this allows the uh, system people to uh, uh, also uh, um, you know improve the resource allocation uh, uh, in the way that uh, that the market economy uh, would. So this combination of the old track and, and the new track. Uh, manifests itself in multiple uh, areas, including the special economic zone. Special economic, economic zone is an arrangement in which within a geographic area, temporarily you, you practice a different kind of economic system from the rest of the country. And once the special economic zones or the, or the capitalist model practiced there, prove themselves, it, it, it gets spread to the rest of the uh, country. This way of managing uh, policy change uh, creates a lot of weakness, uh, why minimizing uh, losers? I think it's very interesting thing. Uh, uh, very interesting thing uh, for us to 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 think about. And number so again, four, we uh, need to we need to close need to in about yeah. two or three minutes for questions. Okay, so yeah. maybe one one minute, uh, forty seconds uh, 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 on, on the last uh, slide uh, per per lesson. That correcting market failure decisively uh, is very uh, uh, important. You need to create common inputs, create the markets, uh, and com uh, combating anti-competitive uh, behavior at the micro level, but also macro level, uh, managing aggregate demand. Sometimes micro macro can, can uh, meet uh, each other. Chinese high speed uh, rail expansion is an example of this, that very poor infrastructure common to uh, developing countries uh, and uh, was present in China was a drag on, on growth. You could wait for a private sector to, to get enough funding, develop this, compute toll roads and so on, or you could, uh, 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 you know, look at uh, uh, what US has done and other countries has done in their practice, not what the uh, uh, US economists say, uh, uh, what uh, should be uh, done. And government can, can play a role in building out the uh, uh, infrastructure. And when a global financial crisis came, uh, 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 you can also speed up, speed, up, speed up the process. And that's what we see that uh, you know, China had a 25 year plan to build out uh, uh, high speed rails and, uh, and highways. But when global financial crisis, they heard President Obama talk about shovel-ready projects. President Obama couldn't quite do that in the US. The Chinese asked themselves, do we have shovel-ready projects? They, they, discovered, they, they, they saw that they have this uh, railway project to be planned for the next 10, 20 years. They say, why don't we do now? Uh, that's, that we, that's how we get the, the high-speed rail network and highway system today. I'm going to skip this. Cultivating pro-growth bureaucracy is kind of uh, uh, interesting because it gives us both positive lessons and, and uh, uh, negative lessons. When growth is uh, a K, uh, KPI for bureaucrats, bureaucrats try very hard to try to help firms to grow. But uh, at the same time, you know, when environmental protection is not part of the KPI, bureaucrats uh, don't uh, pay enough attention uh, to this. This uh, um, uh, matrix learning uh, is something that I observe as an Asian Development Bank uh, chief economist. I visited many, uh, many uh, member countries, visiting ADB projects, uh, and talking to firms and government officials. So here's what I uh, uh, I ask uh, my ADB uh, development colleagues: you know, What do they think is the difference between 
the, the, the China they have dealt, dealt with and other you know, India and other developing countries they have dealt with. So here's an uh, interesting observation. So, so China has 31 also uh, administrative regions, and then you have multiple sectors that ADB World Bank uh, uh, make uh, loans to. ADB World Bank don't just provide low cost uh, uh, financing, they also provide expertise on how to manage uh, you know, local community. Uh, uh, you know, if you have to move a community, how do you manage this uh, 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 in, a, in a sensible way, environmental protection, financial, uh, various kinds of so-called so uh, safeguards. The, the, the Chinese uh, um, counterpart to development agencies would have a matrix in mind that any given region, any given sector in a particular cycle will only get one project. So Guizhou province cannot apply for two power plant project from World Bank. The central government will not apply because there's a limited number of projects we can get from World Bank and IMF and, uh, and ADB. Um, so, so they were trying to essentially compute the matrix that any given region will get multiple sec projects in multiple sectors. And the idea is that they will then, the local government will spread this uh, to other similar projects uh, in, in the region. So in other words, there's a very deliberate learning uh, 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 sort of a building to those uh, uh, those international assistance uh, projects that China uh, is exposed to, something you know, other countries can do, but not typically, uh, not commonly uh, done. And lastly, rotation of, of officials, so governor of uh, in, in Zhejiang province can become number one official in Sichuan province, and, and vice versa. This uh, type uh, type of uh, 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 rotation uh, can also facilitate the the, the learning uh, process. I seem to have missed the slides about, I have a slide about uh, important uh, uh, errors. You know, the, the, you have negative lessons, I guess final thing I want to say is negative lessons are as important as positive uh, uh, lessons. Uh, you, you can have uh, pollution if, if environmental protection is not part of a KPI. You can have inequality if you have a very unbalanced uh, uh, growth uh, model. Uh, and uh, you can have, uh, uh, you know, variety of, uh, of uh, other uh, problems. To think about lessons from uh, uh, China, I guess uh, it's useful to keep in mind that we don't want to compare China with an idealized textbook model of how market economy is supposed to work. We want to compare that with actual market economies in existence. And there you will see that in fact, uh, you know, much of the, uh, to the extent China has some success, much of the success are confirmation of the uh, base, same basic principles that, that, that gets confirmed from the success of a, of a, of a Western economies uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, well. And those are, those are important things to keep in mind. But, but of course, equally important in applying those principles, one needs to pay attention to local uh, constraints, and one needs to adapt, something that Professor An uh, uh, has uh, stressed. And you don't want to mechanically apply uh, those uh, lessons. And this is uh, are very important. So, 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 the, so, so, therefore, the success of China and success of uh, Western economic uh, uh, models have a lot more similarities than perhaps one realizes uh, at the first glance. Let me conclude here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shang Jin. That was excellent and very, very complimentary to Yuan's uh, presentation. I don't, I don't think there are many disagreements here as much as that you elaborated on some of the points that. Uh, Yuan made uh, in, with, some, with some depth. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of questions. That's one reason I was hurrying you up because uh, uh, there are a lot of people who uh, want to chime in. So I, and I want to do justice to all those questions. So let me, let, uh, let me ask, and I, we've grouped some questions together. So let me ask you three questions uh, uh, and I'll go to Yuan first and then to Shang Jin. Um, so the first is uh, Prakash Kashwan asked this question, but I guess I, I had the same question, so I'm going to uh, add myself to that list, uh, which is that you know many developing countries are trying to do adaptive governance of the type that you describe, um, but they don't seem to be able to do it. Uh, what is it that makes China special of having been able to successfully you know, adapt to adaptive governance. Uh, and in particular, you know, when I think of your typical developing countries, they try something and it doesn't seem to be working. How do you decide that the reason it's not working or, or if it's not working, therefore you should change course? 
or should you keep doing it and try to do it better so that it will eventually work? Um, the second question several people have asked, uh, Anna, Fano, and a few others, uh, which is China's economic growth has come at a cost. Um, uh, and there are various costs. Uh, you Both of you have mentioned the environmental uh, costs, uh, but uh, some of those questioners were asking also about the human rights, uh, the cost to uh, uh, of, of human rights. And, and the question is now when we look back, should they have done it differently? Uh, would, would there have been a way in which China could have maybe grown less rapidly, but protected the environment earlier on, uh, or uh, given more um, space for, for human rights uh, than, than was possible? And then finally, uh, Sheng Li and a few others have asked uh, about China's role in the developing world right now. I mean, China is a major donor and uh, investor in developing countries. And the question is, is China's uh, practice of development assistance uh, reflective of its own development trajectory? Uh, and or, or is it something that's reflective of the OECD DAC principles or a third uh, possibility? So let me stop with those three questions and turn it to you, Yuan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, I I, I want to thank um, I want to thank Songjing for a really illuminating presentation that provoked a lot of my thoughts. And these are three really excellent questions. Um, I could go on for an hour, but obviously I've only had five minutes. I'll keep my remarks as brief as possible. The first question was about um, other developing countries have tried to do adaptive governance, and and it appears that they don't have the scale of of success that we have seen in China. And why is that? Um, and the, the reason for that is that it does have to do with regime type. We all know that China is a single party autocracy. The consequence of that is that change in China happens on the national scale because you have this extreme political centralization. So the consequences can be either very bad, as, you, as we see in the Mao period, or very good. So the advantage in China is once they have the right leader, who puts the country in the right direction, like Deng Xiaoping, then there is the apparatus and the mechanisms for creating adaptive governance at scale. So one of the things that uh, Beijing is able to do very effectively is that when they see local experiments that work, there is the mechanism for finding these experiments and scaling it up nationally. Whereas if you look at many developing countries, um, there, there isn't that capacity for finding successes on the ground, and there isn't that capacity for scaling. Nevertheless, I would question the assumption that developing countries have no other success cases in adaptive governance. I would definitely challenge that assumption. I think there is a lot of adaptive development happening on the ground every single day, but it's just that they're not documented by development economists. They're not within our conventional realm of, of dialogue and, and research. So some of my new research, including you can see uh, in the conclusion of my first book, um, I looked at pockets of entrepreneurial success in the global south. So some examples I've given is the rise of the film industry in Nigeria, the rise of tech startups throughout Southeast Asia, the rise of the mortgage industry in India in the absence of good institutions. So the difference that you see in these cases is that of course people are adaptive, of course people are doing experiments and hustling on the ground. The difference when you compare them to China is that their adaptive success is limited to a pocket limited to a part of the country or a sector of the economy because they lack China's mechanism for scaling up successes nationally. So I think that that's the key difference when we look at different kinds of adaptive governance or development around the global south. But I wouldn't dismiss you know, the existence of entrepreneurship uh, in developing countries. And then the second question is, is human rights part of the cause? Um, I would think about human rights as a consistent problem in an authoritarian regime. I don't think of it as a cost of economic growth because 
um, even in the Mao period, of course, there were human rights uh, abuses and of course, there were political repression. So analytically, I don't see human rights as a direct consequence of rapid economic growth. The costs that I see that are a consequence of that very rapid industrial economic growth would be things like pollution, inequality and corruption. Um, and should they have done it differently? Ah, that's a very good question. Uh, almost kind of philosophical. Um, I think in life, we always say, oh, I, you know, now with the benefit of hindsight, you know, I would have gone back and do all of these things differently. Um, and I think that um, if you look not only at Chinese history, but even at American and European history, I think what you find is that um, people often will not do things differently, if then, even if they had the benefit of hindsight, because at the time when they were using these less than perfect methods, they didn't have the impetus to carry out difficult reforms. So in the case of both America and China, in the case, let's take the American Gilded Age in the 19th century. The, it, it took five financial crashes before the American government was actually willing to say, well, we need to take on all of these structural reforms because our system is so risky. So I think today the Chinese government is also well aware that their system has so many problems, but you know, sometimes you actually do need a crisis or a threat of some kind to have the necessary impetus to make the necessary changes. So, so that would be my response, but you know, I think it's a, it's a deep philosophical question. And then the third one, I think it's a really very, very insightful question. Is the Chinese practice of development assistance reflective of its own trajectory? Um, very good question, because I'm going to answer in, in, on several, in several ways. First of all, in my experience, one of the things that really surprised me in, in my interactions with Chinese colleagues is that there actually is not such a thing as a Beijing consensus in China, meaning that you know the, all of these Chinese elites know that this is our model. That actually is not such a thing. And, and that within China, I find that there is until today ongoing debate about what is it exactly that we have done in order to get this far. And I think it's important for the world to realize that this debate is still going on even within China. And so there are some within China who feel that what the China model is are the grand stuff. And so they like to boast about the grand infrastructure, you know, the tallest bridges, the longest railways, because they feel that those are the impressive things that they can make China look good on the world stage. And they sometimes apply the euphemism, strong state, you know, in referring to the authoritarian regime. And, but you also find another side of China where it, the elites are actually a lot more open-minded and liberal, and, and they are quite intrigued and, and quite, and quite um, interested when I share with them my perspective, which is that what you did right is adaptive governance. Um, and it's very interesting to kind of see them being rather surprised by this idea because they practice adaptive governance without theorizing about it. And so, so when they understand that, it's, not, it's, it's quite surprising to them. And so um, in response, again, back to the question, I think my short response would be, um, I don't think that there's a consensus within China about what the model is, but there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot, there are high stakes in this narrative. And this narrative is still open to debate and influence. And so therefore, I think that providing China with an accurate historical account of how it actually came so far is important, not only for developing countries, but for China itself, because China is, as rightly pointed out, now a big player in development assistance. Thank you. Thanks very much. Brilliant. I really like those answers, uh, but they also provoke uh, more questions. Shangjin, I'm going to let you answer uh, anything you want of those three questions. You don't have to take them all. And also, yeah. if you want to comment on what uh, Yuan said. Well, I think uh, Yuan's uh, answers are really uh, excellent. And, and, and to the first question, I guess I would say that you know every country has to work with its own institutional 
uh, institutional uh, constraints uh, uh, and, and advantages and disadvantages, it's hard to transplant, transplant any other country's actual way of doing things uh, uh, directly. Uh, the, the, but I would uh, uh, argue that the basic principles still uh, important that you want to uh, uh, you know, promote competition, empowering um, people, and you know, look for uh, barriers to those things uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to adapt and, and reform. Uh, uh, number one, number two, to the, to the second uh, question, in a way, you know, the, all the, the, the problems that we see in China, you know, pollution, uh, inequality environment, certainly those areas are part of the things that we tend to see in other developing uh, countries. That's why, uh, you know, uh, Simon Kuznets uh, proposed this so-called the Kuznets curve regularities that many of the problems tend to first become worse uh, as a country uh, develops and then improves because people, societies demand for cleaner air, uh, uh, more equal uh, outcome and so on also uh, uh, changes. And uh, we, we sort of see uh, China is moving the same trajectory. One difference is that the more centralized system of, of China means that when local officials, you know, did not have those things uh, in their KPR, uh, you know, they, uh, you, they tend to uh, 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 over promote ac activities at the cost of those areas. But, you know, when, uh, you know, for example, China has essentially uh, led the develop developing world by pledge carbon neutrality is by 2060, a very demanding target. Central bureaucracy can mobilize the entire bureaucracy to, to do this. And in fact, officials, local officials and entrepreneurs, they were very worried about how costly those transition will be. The transition will be good for the world, but uh, they, they regard this as, 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 a, as, a, as a very costly uh, uh, to, uh, to them. Hopefully other country can manage this better than uh, than China uh, does. In terms of a uh, Chinese role in, in global development assistance, you know, it's, it's a sort of a two-sided uh, uh, coin that for many countries, having some competition uh, from China versus other countries, you know, has some benefits, you know, lower the cost of funding, uh, provide a variety of, uh, of uh, uh, cho uh, choices, for, uh, not just money, but also money, uh, ideas to think about. And the ideas from China is not so much about authoritarian model. And it's, I think that China, doesn't AIB, for example, does not promote authoritarian um, model, but uh, every country reflects on its own experience. Uh, it's, it's hard to uh, avoid. Uh, in Chinese case, um, you know, uh, they, uh, there's a saying that, uh, that, that to build prosperity, you have to build roads, meaning infrastructure is very important. You don't want to necessarily wait private sector to perfect the road system, railways, and so on. And some uh, public sector's uh, road there is important. China should have trans, uh, transplant their kind of idea in its development uh, systems. Uh, to the extent this is really not really new to, uh, from Chinese experience. Western economy, economic success also comes from public sector support for, uh, for infrastructure. Uh, both World Bank and ADB have projected a very large uh, shortage of basic infrastructure in many, many developing countries to the, to the extent uh, Chinese development systems can speed up their process, that's probably uh, uh, useful. But the same kind of problems we see in Chinese uh, model, not sufficient weight uh, put on environmental protection and, and others is a lesson that one needs to keep in mind. I, and I think uh, you know, one thing that one can, uh, uh, you know, we in the West can do is that to, to work with China. So let's take example of AIB. China has invited US to join and US so far has declined. The irony is the I, AIB uh, doesn't just want, the AIB said it wants to uh, adopt international best practices. Uh, it, it looked at the World Bank uh, model and so on. In some area, AIB in fact is doing better than existing international uh, best practices. For example, most development banks says all projects supported by a bank should be restricted to firms from member countries. AIB is the first international institution that I know that does not have that. All AIB supported projects is available to firms from any countries, including from non-member countries. AIB does not use uh, this term that uh, better than international best practices, but that's a uh, concrete uh, area that is. But to the extent you, if you, you know, if you don't think uh, AIB or other Chinese uh, system programs uh, pay enough attention to social safeguards, environmental safeguards, governance safeguards, work with them. Being a shareholder, like European countries and do, and you can, uh, you know, uh, have your ideas being incorporated in those system uh, programs. So I think there's uh, another concrete areas in which 
uh, in, in which uh, you know we can do more to work with the Chinese international programs. Great, thanks very much. Uh, I, there's so many questions that I'm really tempted to uh, uh, ask a few more. So let, let me uh, see. So this one is from Heather Jaffa. Um, China is a financial and economic power, but is it also becoming a political power? And what will this mean to other countries? And there's a related question, which is, uh, it, what will China's relationship with Africa be in the future? Will it be extractive or supportive? Um, and then let me just take one more. It is uh, this, uh, I don't know, of John Matheson. Uh, China has a long tradition of an educated bureaucracy. Is that a key to its ability to adapt? Okay, uh, let me turn to Yuan again. Thank you. Uh, two excellent questions. I will take the second one first. It, are educated bureaucrats uh, key to China's uh, economic success? So uh, it is true that China has a very long thousands of years of history of a, a meritocratic elite kind of a Mandarin bureaucracy. And that therefore gives people the impression that you know, throughout China's modern history, it's always had educated bureaucrats. And I wanted to give you a simple statistics. Uh, in, in the mid 1970s, there was a study conducted on the levels of schooling among China's local leaders. It was 4.5 years, and these are local leaders. And of course, it's not surprising because their education, including that of the Chinese president himself, was interrupted by the Cultural Revolution, where for 10 years, schools and universities shut down. So actually, when reforms first started, China started with a bureaucracy that was really exhausted by the mass chaos, the violence that had been deprived of education. Most of them were actually uh, peasants who knew revolutionary slogans and didn't have the technocratic knowledge. But that techno uh, but the technocratic aspects, of course, built up as China became uh, richer. So if you look at my historical accounts, you'll find that in the early period of China's economic opening, um, a lot of the bureaucracy actually drew on different forms of local knowledge, including their personal networks um, and other kind of practices that from the first world perspective, we would dismiss as backward. So I think it's important to qualify this impression of uh, an educated bureaucracy in China. The other qualifier that I would add is that China has the paradox of having a meritocratic bureaucracy that really emphasizes performance and particularly economic performance, but it also has corruption in this meritocratic, uh, in this meritocratic bureaucracy. So I have coined the term a corrupt meritocracy, which is kind of paradoxical because we, we think these things should not coexist, uh, but they actually do in a very logical way in China, um, in the Chinese political system. Um, an official does have to perform and be very competent in order to win support from his, from his higher ups. Um, and he also often needs some level of corruption in order to meet his targets and perform. So these sort of contradictory qualities actually coexist in China's bureaucracy. So I think it would help to have this more nuanced understanding of how the bureaucratic system works. The first set of question opens up multiple questions actually. And again, I could go on for one hour. Uh, I'll try to be brief. The first um, sub question was about uh, whether China will become a political power in addition to being an economic one. And I think this is the big debate that we are having these days in US-China relations, you know, whether China will export you know, its, its, its model uh, with the assumption that uh, this model is about the success of authoritarian control uh, and whether China will reshape you know, ideological values and, and champion authoritarianism and so forth. So my response to that kind of debate has always been the following. 
um, I keep emphasizing that we need to have a historically grounded understanding of how China actually succeeded. And we need to resist this simplistic narrative, as I said in my presentation, that ah, authoritarianism must be the answer because it's rich and it's authoritarian and it's authoritarian. So that's the answer. Uh, we need to understand that what really enabled China's performance is that even though it was an autocracy, it was willing to embrace adaptive governance um, and it was even willing to incorporate what I call democratic characteristics. So that was the part uh, that appeared briefly in, in Shang Jing's slide. And I took it out because I thought there wasn't enough time to elaborate. Um, and what I mean by democratic characteristics is that China is in terms of regime type, obviously not a democracy. It does, it, it does practice political repression, but it is willing to incorporate elements of competition, accountability, meritocracy, and these sort of qualities that we associate with democracy into its authoritarian regime. And it is this hybrid practice that has enabled success. So I think it's, first of all, important for us to get the narrative right, because this narrative is so politically charged and so many parties are trying to control the narrative and spin it in a way that, that they like. But um, I think from a scholarly and academic perspective, we want to try to present the accurate historical account. So what will be China's relationship with Africa? Um, that's a big question. Um, and I think the short answer is that it is rapidly evolving. And I don't subscribe to the view that China had one intention or grand plan from the beginning and will be sticking to it. What we have seen in the past, I would say five to eight years, is that this path of China's trying to become an active player in global development is that it kept evolving. It tried some things and then it realized that it failed disastrously and then it tried the course correct. And um, more interestingly, many of the kind of domestic issues that used to be within China are now exported overseas. So one example I give is confusion about what is the Belt and Road Initiative. Right, the world is confused about what is exactly is the BRI. Uh, but for someone, if you study Chinese domestic politics, you know that ambiguity is actually one of the essential qualities of Chinese adaptability. But when that is exported overseas, there is tremendous confusion because we are not used to this kind of a political system that is very different from the legalistic uh, Western norm. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, I'm afraid I, we have to close at what is a, obviously a very exciting discussion and there's a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, so let me just uh, thank uh, uh, Yuan, Yuan Nang and Shang Jin Wei for a fascinating uh, set of presentations and discussions and answers to questions. Let me thank the audience for their questions. I think the engagement was superb. Uh, and I look forward to continuing this discussion uh, as we try to learn lessons from China for the developing world. So thank you all very much.